Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from the CUNY TV Foundation, Capital One Bank, Genova Burns, Gian Tomasi and Webster, New York Community Bank, the Wickoff Group, m and Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company. Additional funding is provided by grants from AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Aerial Property Advisors, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Leumi, USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Colliers International, NYC, Cushman and Wakefield, Customers Bank, DDG, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Eastern Union Funding, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Herrick Feinstein, LLP, Hersha Hospitality Trust, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Margolin Weiner and Evans, LLP, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Matone Group, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, New Banks, People's United Bank, RBS Citizens Bank, SJP Properties, Sterling & Sterling, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, The Continuum Company, LLC, and These Friends. So, you know, you get these kids, they grow up in New York City, yeah, and they, they decide, you know, they go to St. John's University, and subsequently they say, you know, I want to be a DEA agent, a, a drug enforcement agent. And you join the DEA, and you go around the country in some of the strangest and toughest cities around, and then you retire, before you retire, you become the head of the DEA in New York. I'm very lucky to have my friend Lewis Rice to tell us something about his life story. Thanks for coming tonight. Thank you, Michael, and good to be here. So tell me a little bit about your grandparents. They were from South Carolina, right? Sure. My grandmother and grandfather were for, from Columbia, South Carolina. They got married extremely young and wound up having three kids, one boy and two girls. So when do they come here, your, your grandparents? They came to the... Uh, they came to New York, Brooklyn, New York, Bed-Stuy, probably around 1920, 1925. And what does your grandfather uh, do when he's my, here? My grandfather was an elevator operator, you know, and uh, he may have been involved in some type of uh, activity called the numbers. Oh, so he, you know, it's interesting. When I was growing up in Brooklyn, I used to go to this barber shop uh, on Avenue, uh, uh, X and uh, what happened is I always wondered how Luigi the bar uh, the, the barber made money, but somebody said there were numbers over yeah, there. So yeah. it was a well during that time, if you if you remember and, and track the history, numbers were games of hope. It was sort of like the early stage of the lottery, and, and really it was a way for people that had great reputations to make a little bit of money because the number banker had to be somebody that was respected. Right, because and they'd be able to collect on Collect, and you would give them their, your money. You'd so, give them your hard-earned so money. This, so this is your grandfather on your father's side? Yes, grandfather. I believe it okay. may have been. So that's your grandfather on your father's side. Tell me about your grandparents on your mother's side. Well, my grandfather on my mother's side died uh, very early, you know, uh, in an accident. And uh, my grandmother, you know, was in New York at, uh, at some point also, and then she, she died... Uh, probably about uh, 30, 40 years ago. So how do your parents meet? They met uh, in, in school, you know, and, and my dad was from Brooklyn, my mother was from Queens, they would go to different parties and they would meet, you know, boys and girls socializing and, uh, and my mother was basically a, uh, a uh, post high school bride. 
So, but they got married very young. You see. Nineteen years of age. You know, we we have the pictures of your of your parents uh, getting married. So they're nineteen years of age, and at that time, what was Dad doing? Dad was initially at nineteen. He was a truck driver, and uh, you know, doing a lot of odd and end jobs. And then at some point, the job in the police department opened up, and he took the test and. Uh, he was able to become a New York City police officer. So he, he's like, what, 21 at this time? About 20, about 22, 23. You told me uh, about your dad. Y your dad originally s ended up in sex crimes and he was involved up in Harlem, correct? Yes, yes. Uh, and, and, you know, we, we have this thing that your dad, uh, he had 20 years of service over here and a variety, you know, this is, you know, we'll take a picture of all his patrolmen and, you know, he's Lewis Rice Sr. Senior, over here. right. Okay, your dad uh, subsequently afterwards retires, right? Yes, he, he did at some point. But uh, during his career, he worked uh, the juvenile section in, in Brooklyn. He worked also for a long period of time in the 6th Detective Division up in Harlem, the burglary robbery squad. And, and immediately before he retired uh, in the 70s, he was transferred to the sex crime unit, which was a new but important unit in the New York City Police Department. So let's talk about you growing up. You, you, you grew up uh, where? In, uh, in Queens, in the projects in Queens. Right, and uh, brothers, sisters? One sister, uh, a couple of years younger than me. So, and, and at some point, uh, you know, as things happened, my mom and dad separated when I was about uh, 11 years old. And uh, really emotionally devastated me because uh, my dad was my hero. You know, he was sort of like Superman. But you did tell me you saw your dad quite a bit, even though... All the, the time. Pressure. Every weekend he would come over, take my sister and I out to different events. We'd spend the weekend with him, go to my grandmother's house. So we still had that family relationship, even though he wasn't living in the house. Now, so when you were growing up, you, you originally went to public school the first couple of years, right? Uh, I went to public school for kindergarten. Right, and then you went to parochial school. Parochial school in Queens, yes, for so the first eight years. Right, so tell me about the, the life in the parochial schools with the nuns and all the rest. It was, uh, I, I, I guess at one point, looking back, it was probably the best thing for me because it was discipline. Uh, you would, you know, take it, you had to be prepared. You had to take a test. There was a lot more accountability. And, you know, young people really need accountability. And so, you know, I may not have enjoyed it going through it, but as I look back on my life, I'm, I'm glad I had that foundation. Now, during the, 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 the Christmas vacations and the summers, you, you were doing what? Oh, boy, I had a, always had a, 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 some type of job, either a, a paper route. I worked in the neighborhood youth corps. I used to work at the old A&S back then. Uh, worked in the post office. Worked the, the Gimbals also, right? Gimbals, uh, that's right. You had a good memory. Uh, and so I always had a job. So, so you're in high school, at Catholic school, and then you decide before you graduate that you, you wanted to go back to, pu to, to go to public school. Yeah. So what happened? What was well, I guess being a teenager, you know, I had some friends, close friends that I thought were close friends, and uh, there were some conversations in the locker room that, uh, you know, were about race and racial issues, and uh, it, it, it really devastated me emotionally because I thought these were my close friends and uh, really had to take a time out, you know. And so I went home and, you know, I was living with my mom, and she knows that, uh, you know, she knew me and, and loved me, and I said, Mom, I really don't want to go back there, you know. And uh, she said, okay, you know, uh, you can go to public school. And, and I went to public school for, uh, for two years. So you graduated high school. What year is this? Graduated high school in 1970. So it's 1970. It's the, 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 uh, it's the heavy time of the Vietnam Wars, because I happened to be in the Army Reserve at that time. You know, 69, sure. 70 was a tough time in the Vietnam War. And how did you decide to apply to St. John's University? Well, after two years of public school, I could easily see the difference between going to a Catholic school where discipline, where accountability was number one, and going to a public school where maybe the expectation wasn't that high that you were going to succeed. And I said, uh, you know, sooner or later, sooner rather than later, I'm going to want to strike out on my own and get a good job, and figuring that having St. John's University on my resume as a place that I graduated from would be a good thing and I uh, wanted to get back into a more competitive academic environment. Now, when you initially started St. John's, you really were, you, were you planning criminal justice at that time? 
No, I, I wanted to go into an area where I could help people. Uh, maybe probation, parole, not really law enforcement, in spite of the fact that my dad was a New York City police officer because around that time there was a lot of tension between African-American youth and the police. But I think there was a story that once you, got a, you were driving the car in Harlem and you, and sure. you got picked over. Tell me about sure. that story. So, uh, I, my grandmother or maternal grandmother lived in East Harlem. And uh, my mother and I were driving up to uh, her residence in about 111th Street off 1st Avenue. I was driving, mother was a passenger, and a police officer pulled me over, and uh, he said he was pulling me over because the music was too loud, and uh, really was talking to me very aggressively and insulting me. And, you know, I'm a, you know, 18, 19 year old man, and. You know, I have a little ego, and I was, wasn't too happy about that and uh, talking to me directly like that even in front of my mother. But I complied, showed him my license, and uh, he gave me a ticket for speeding. So he said I was music too loud and, and speeding. And so I noticed on his lapel he had the insignia for the 2-5 precinct, and that's where my dad uh, was working as a detective during that time. So we spoke to my dad that evening. I told him, you know, I met one of your one of his colleagues. fellow colleagues, right? And uh, you know, the guy was very extremely aggressive. And my dad was always balanced. He always said, you know, there's good and bad in all races. And if you're very aggressive like that and trying to intimidate people, you know, sooner or later that comes back at you. And so my he said, so what do you what do you think? I said, well, dad, you know. I was not speeding, and the music wasn't loud. I'm going to plead not guilty. So he said, okay, that's your choice. So at the appropriate time, I went down. I pled not guilty. I went before the, uh, I guess, not a, really a judge, but a magistrate, referee, whoever was handling that uh, issue. The police officer was there, and you know, I t told him that I was pleading not guilty. The police officer said, uh, I don't have my memo book. I don't really remember this, that, and the other thing. So. The, uh, the referee threw it out, and so as we were leaving, you know, the police officer came over to me and said, why don't you tell me your dad was a police officer? Because you didn't want any special... Well, I, I, I told him, I said, for, number one, you didn't give me a chance to say anything. Number two, I didn't feel that comfortable saying that because I, I feel, based on the facts, I didn't do what you, you said I could do, and you were sort of like shutting me down. And so I said, oh, I wouldn't have given you the ticket of what I'd known that. But I said, hey, you know, I'm just a citizen just driving. I'm with my mom, you know, of all people. And my, my mother was not really into loud music, so I wouldn't be, may, I may want to try to turn it up, but she definitely turned it down. Talk about something which really had a major impact on your life. Uh, when you're in college and you and two buddies are, are, are stopped in the projects. <sighs> so uh, it's probably about my... Uh, Junior year in junior, college. Junior, senior year in college. You got a good memory. Junior year in college, senior year. And uh, it was in the fall, and we were just uh, talking and having a good time, three of us. And uh, neither of the th none of the three had ever been in trouble with the law, so nothing. And uh, one of the police officers in uniform came over, a housing police officer, African-American police officer, and he said, uh, you know, do you realize that you know, the way the laws are written, you can go to jail for nothing. Just if you don't even have to commit a crime, you can go to jail. And so, you know, we had seen, you know, uh, things happen in the neighborhood involving police. So we, we kind of knew that, you know, instinctively. And uh, he, he, said, he said, yeah, okay. He says, you know, I want to show you this in the law. And we said, okay, no, we, we believe you. And, you know, he, then he grabbed his nightstick a little tight. He says, no, I want, you, want to show you in the law. He said, come with me. So we walked with him, a little concerned, but not really concerned because we had not done anything. We went to the housing police ramp, and he asked us to sit on the bench inside the ramp. We sat on the bench and looking at each other, wondering what's going on. And he went and got a, looked like a law book and sat behind the desk and started going through the law book and we <laughs> looking at each other saying, man, this guy's really serious about this. And okay, we just watched him. Uh, two white police officers come in there at some point. They look at us. They look at him. 
they all, all three go into the back, and then they come out, and they say, okay, you guys, this is it, you know, take off your clothes, you know. And the, the African-American police officer had his head down, and we're looking at each other, the, 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 my two friends, really confused, scared, uh, wondering what's going on. And so we had to strip. So we stripped, and uh, I, I remember this like yesterday, and it's, it's probably over 40 years ago, you know. Uh, I had a nice white knit sweater and dropped it on the floor. And, you know, the police human, the cop picked it up. Oh, it's a nice sweater. Don't drop it on the floor. It's white. It picked it up. And, uh, and we stood down there for a while, and we didn't have anything on us, you know. Uh, and the, the word, I would imagine, started to gather in the neighborhood that three of the guys that don't, that are not involved in anything are with the police. And so at some point, we were let out. The people from the local precinct, 114, came down, and they put us in the police cars. But as we were walking back up the ramp, uh, Crowds and crowds of people were out because these are three of the guys that don't get in trouble, that get along with everybody, and now they're in, the, in police custody, so to speak. And one of the guys asked me, he said, what can we do for you? What can we do for you? I said, uh, let my mother know, you know. And so we rode up, they drove us up to the police station, and we sat down in there, still didn't know what was going on, still wasn't told uh, what was going on. And at some point, uh, my mother came up there. So basically, it was harassment. And as you said to me when we got together, well, the guy was on probation, and he really wanted well, to have the case. Yeah, it, it, it was harassment, I think it's, but it's important I, I get to the point. So when she came up there, she wasn't intimidated. She was angry because she said, that's her son, and I know he's a, a, he's a good child. And uh, the police officer asked my mother her name, and my mom said, hey, no, what's your name? And he told her, police officer X. And at some point, she had already called my dad, and my dad came in there. And when he came in there, he wasn't happy either. And he was angry. He let it be known. Uh, they went in the back. He and a couple of police officers they had a seemed like forever conversation, and we we're just sitting there watching. And all of a sudden, at some point, he came out, and he told us, me and my two friends, to come into the bathroom in the precinct. And he said, this is the deal. This officer's on probation doesn't know if he's going to be sustained or not as a from permanent police officer. And, you know, he figured if he took you guys in, it would show that he's doing a good job. He said, the deal is you're going to walk out of here today because you haven't done anything wrong. But if you see him again in the neighborhood, walk the other way. Don't tease him. Don't say anything to him. You got that? And we said, we got it. And we went out. Right. During college, you worked at Rikers Island in the, prop, in the property section? The uh, receiving, uh, receiving room. Right, receiving room. And so now it's you're ready to graduate. And in 1973, President Nixon starts a new agency called the Drunk Enforcement Agency. And something's interesting because you are seeing many of the kids who you went to high school and who grew up in the projects coming back from Vietnam War Basically druggies, yeah. drug addicts. Well, it was the Drug Enforcement Administration. Right. You're right, July of 73. And uh, a lot of people thought I joined DEA because my dad was a police officer, but exactly the opposite. Uh, I joined because my friends, who were just nice guys, party, go out with the girls, have a good time, kid around with each other, they went to Vietnam and they came back as drug addicts. Or, and some of them even overdosed. And this was during the time of the late 60s, 70s, where their parents had fought with Martin Luther King for civil rights, for equality, so that we could go to a good school, we could get a good job. And they realized, our parents, that they would, would not benefit from it, but they lived for their children. Right. And the parents were devastated when their kids came home as drug addicts. So that was really the, the inertia the, 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 that caused the, you know, the spark that caused you to one of the reasons that that was one the other one was at some point when I went to the precinct uh, with my dad to do this criminal justice program I saw these African-American men detectives in plain clothes the big hats the suits and they had that swagger you you said so, changed so there the was, impression so there was the aura them. that you know I, I want to be an undercover cop I, well it wasn't an undercover cop it was no, this this is what men do men 
they're chasing bad guys. They're going after the bad guys that you read about in the papers, the murderers, the bank robbers, the rapists, who are very tough people, changing society. These are the men that are hunting them down. And to be in their environment, in that police station, to hear them talk, to see their swagger, I gained renewed respect and said, hey, these are the guys that are hurting the community. I want to be on the right side. Now, what's interesting, you know, you, at that time, uh, the program was like eight weeks, the training program. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then you become a, an agent, right. an undercover agent, because a, at that, in New York City. You right. come back to work in New York City. But you make a great comment that about being an agent, it's a 24-7, no life. I mean, right. your life is DEA. Right. And what was the comment about if you were supposed to be married? Well, let, let me just put this in context. So you, you are a special agent, but back then, the way you made your bones, the way you got promoted, you had to work undercover because the drug guys, they weren't talking to anybody unless you came to their territory. So it was bed it was Harlem, it was South Jamaica. You had to go there and meet them. And this was in after-hour joints, places where they buzz you in, dimly lit. And it was tough work. And on the surveillance side, the surveillance guys would follow these guys 24-7 around the clock. We, we would even sleep in the cars, okay? So it wasn't a job that was conducive to family life. And the adage was, DEA gives you a badge, DEA gives you a gun. If DEA wanted you to have a wife, they would have issued you one also. Right. Real men yeah. chase drug dealers. Now, you've had many cases, but uh, and I have a picture over here. We, you know, a lot of people talk about uh, a number of years ago, there was the movie American Gangster. Uh, and right. Frank Lucas, who is this major drug man up in Harlem uh, and in New Jersey and a, a variety of things, a, a good movie, which partially is true, partially is not when it happens with the movie. Uh, basically, Frank Lucas never spoke about on anyone else, right? Well, let, let, when you say partially true, I, I think... Uh, for those that were around during this time, and I'm talking about the agents and the police officers, they would say that the only thing true of, in the movie was that Frank Lucas was a major drug dealer. Okay. So tell me about this picture. So th this is a picture of the uh, arrest team and the case management team for the investigation uh, in which Frank Lucas testified, the only investigation. And this is as a result uh, of a uh, seizure of money, uh, guns, and a Rolls Royce uh, in Englewood New Cliffs, New Jersey. And these are the men that ran that investigation. And in addition to that, some of us spent time with Frank Lucas preparing him to testify in court, the only case he ever testified. Mm -hmm. And it was amazing to me, this is... Uh, a story from the 1970s that in 2007 got uh, a new life. Right. So that happened. With a different script. So let, let, let's talk about it. So you're in New York, and over the period of time, wh what's your next stop? Oh, boy. So I left New York. And, and you go to uh, Jamaica? I went to Kingston, Jamaica. Kingston, Jamaica, another place where there days. was yeah. a, uh, a substantial amount of... Uh, Marijuana drug. traffic, transshipment. And how long did you stay in Jamaica? Stayed there about two years, and I got promoted. And then I went from Kingston, Jamaica to another hot spot uh, known as Miami. And you were in Miami for how long? About uh, two and a half years. And that was during some tough times. That's when the cartels were trying to get established in New York. In Scarface. the United States. Scarface. 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 But the true part, they were having shootouts in the malls. Uh, and my impression of Miami in the early 80s with the cartels was that when you arrived at Miami International, they gave you a 9 millimeter and a kilo of coke because everybody had a gun and everybody had cocaine. Extremely dangerous time. So after Russia, Miami, you go where, to Detroit? Washington, Washington D.C., our headquarters, Washington, D.C. And there, in what position are you I in? I was the, uh, part of the inspection division, which travels around the world, They're evaluating DEA officers to make sure they're operating at peak efficiency. After that? And also, I spent some time, I got promoted, and I was in our uh, personnel section, human resources, uh, uh, now is the number two in our worldwide human resources. You finally come back to New York. What year? Well, after that, I got promoted. I'm in uh, Philadelphia, 
I came back to New York in 94, running the uh, New York Drug Enforcement Task Force, which is a combination of DEA agents, New York City detectives, and New York State troopers. Now, how many, 800 people under that? Uh, well, in the task force, probably there was about 300. And so I did that for two years, and then I got promoted as a special agent in charge in Detroit, which covers the states of Michigan, Ohio, and Kentucky. So you retire from the DEA in uh, early 2001, if I remember? Uh, yes, yes. But after I left Detroit, I got promoted to come back to New York. Right. And that's sort of a, like a uh, completion of my career. So how do you decide after you, after you left the DEA, 26 years? Close 26 years and three months. In three months. You decided to, to write this book called DEA Special Agent, My Life on the Front. Uh, two reasons, Michael. When I retired, I'd meet people and they'd ask, what, did you, what are you doing? And they were all amazed that I was retired. They said, how are you retired? You're so young. And I would talk about my career after 26 years in DEA, all the places I've worked. And uh, it, was, it was exciting to a lot of people that were not in federal law enforcement. And uh, they said, you ought to write a book. You ought to write a book. So I had started writing some things down, jotting down my experiences, what I remembered, working at different locations, what the drug threat was, what was going on in the country. And uh, then, you know, we got the word that American Gangster, the movie was coming out. It was going to be the story of life right. of Frank Lucas. And we thought, the agents, we said, well, who's going to play you? Who's going to play you? Who's right. going to play you? And then we found out that they were going in a different direction. Right. That was going to be really fictional. So, so I need to write a book for the record to really chart the history of what these brave men and right, women did. and those did. people. Now, let's talk a little bit. You, you're married. Your wife's name yes, is? Yes, Karen. Karen. And how many children do you have? A total of four children. So tell me about the four children, their names, and the grandchildren, okay, please. Okay, so the, the oldest is uh, Kawan who's in Maryland. And what does Kwan do? He's with uh, an EMT in, the, in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, then there's Latoya. She works for the government in, uh, in Washington, D.C. Then there's Rochelle, who works at a public relations firm here in uh, New York City. And the youngest is uh, Monique, who's in school. Any, a, any uh, little, little uh, races? Three grandchildren, yes. And, and their name? Their names are uh, Aiden, his sister Ayana, and also Ellington. So, you know, in the last 10 years, uh, last 13 years of your life, you've been a corporate cons uh, security consultant for many major organizations and looking after their efforts. Yes. And But what, what I think the real idea is that Louis Rice, a kid who grew up in the streets, who truly gave back to the, to the local streets and to the country, you know, we should be very proud, and I'm proud that I've had you on my show today. Thank you.